Do you want to capitalise on the projected growth opportunities in Brisbane? Streamline Property Buyers are your local area experts. With a qualified property investment advisor, licence builder and rent specialist, making them the most qualified buyers agents in Brisbane. This team know Brisbane property better than anyone else. Find out more at streamlineproperty.com.au Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show with your host, Phil Tarrant. Oh, good day. Hey, gang. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Smart Property Investment Show. Uh, it's been a recording on a Monday and I don't want to sound like it's Groundhog Day, but I'm always looking at auction clearance rates over uh, the weekend as a test of many to work out what's happening in markets. And I'll tell you a bit of a story, anecdotal story, and this might give you a bit of an idea. And it's not about auction clearance. I was about a, a mate of mine who uh, listed a property. Uh, he was going to take it to auction in Roselle, which is near Balmain, late, uh, it was last week sometime. And uh, he got it staged and he was dealing with the agent and he got a bite before they even listed it off market listing. And the person, the final person that purchased the property moved really quickly on securing it and uh, he got well over what the bank valuation was and well over what the agent was originally thinking of uh, listing the property at. So he's absolutely over the moon right now and he's uh, you know, presented the property well and I think staging it really helped along the way. But it go over a real insight into how quick that market is moving and and triggering uh, some change in, in terms of attitude and aptitude of property investors and buyers in that city market. And I'm hearing similar down in Melbourne around uh, above reserves, the number of people turning out for auctions or the number of people who are looking to purchase property at auction, as well as activity and you sort of own a, what do you call it, your uh, private treaty type stuff as well. So stuff's happening and I'm keeping an eye on it, but there's a whole bunch of other people out there who are doing similar and a lot of them are a lot more educated and well-versed than I am on this sort of stuff. One of them is Arjun Paliwell. He's in the studio with me today. He's from a business called Investigate. We know Arjun is a good friend of the Smart Property Investor Show and he's back to join us in the studio. We're going to have a chat about this amongst some other thing. Arjun, how you going, mate? You well? Yeah, well, mate, thank you for having me on again. What are you hearing out there in terms of markets and market movements and just people's sentiments towards or attitudes towards buying property right now? Shift in gear? Yeah, big shift in sentiment. Yeah. And um, media has a big role to play for that. And I think that's always been the start of the, the seesaw when it comes to the sentiment environment, whether people are feeling very, very confident or whether they're in fear. So I think that's definitely a big start on that one, Phil. Yeah. And is it a good thing? Like, you know, is the market now shifting into just another normal cycle? Is that where we're going? Look, it's not good from a blanket approach. Mm. I mean, there's going to be parts and areas where you think of, okay, well, hey, that's a little bit undervalued and I'm glad that it's getting a bit of love now because it's got great proximity to all the key amenities, infrastructure and so much more uh, job movements. But then you've got other areas where you're like, well, days on markets are still not that great. You know, supply is quite high. Vacancy rates are still quite high. And all that's really changed is a bit of sentiment and all of a sudden people are starting to come on board. So yeah, then you wonder, well, are these things happening a bit too early in some parts of the market? Mm. So that's where it's a bit mixed, mate. And I think that's a really good point. So don't get carried away with all the stuff you hear. And, you know, I, I started off this podcast saying, hey, look, this is experience and anecdotal stuff. And a lot of that is what triggers and drives sentiment. And that might not be the case. When you look at there's markets right across Australia, and we'll have a chat about a little bit later on the podcast, Arjun, where, you know, there's still a lot of stock on market. People aren't shifting it. Days on market is taking forever and ever. And then you look at other markets, and I say Sydney and, and Melbourne, where you have you know, there's no stock at all. So people are turning up in droves to, to buy a property because rates are the lowest they've ever been. This is shift and groundswell of, of sentiment where people want to start buying, right? But there's no properties there, hence the reason why you've got it. So it creates a bit of a false market, false economy. So tread with caution. Yeah, and, and I think at the same time, you know, with some of our bigger cities, what's interesting is that a lot of the core fundamentals haven't shifted. I mean, we're still, if we imagine that the last, say, month and a half of certain media hype didn't exist in the, the Sydney and Melbourne worlds, you'd still look at it and go, well, vacancy rates are still pretty high for most places. Peak completions, you know, still operating in that environment, although new building approvals have dropped down. And then you'd also start to look at, well, wages haven't gone anywhere. But in saying that, I think finance alongside that sentiment has started to change it. Now, I think this is where it gets a bit that caution coming back again. Do we see this just that rise starting to come back again and it continues because of the finance changes, because of, you know, sentiment changes? Or do we see a bit of, you know, APRA or RBA caution amongst this environment considering that, you know, the fundamentals that they're after from an economic perspective hmm. still haven't moved the dial? 
So that's where I think that caution can still come up where we've got, hey, you know what? Some great movements that are happening. Guys, this is an important time to watch. But at the same time, we've got, you know, few people biting their nails wondering, well, was it happening a bit too early or is it not? Yeah. And you're never going to know until you get there, right? And you look back and work out how you <laughs> how you sort of had a relationship with those shifts. But, but so investigate, you're a buyer's agent, that's correct. But yep. by, by memory, and we caught up maybe a year or so ago, you used to be a banker. Yeah, right? so you ex- West, did you work at Westpac? Is CBA, that right? CBA. So big four, right? Yeah, cool, <laughs> close enough. One, one, one red, one sort of yellow. But, uh, so, yes, yeah, so you were a sort of a, a little rising star within CBA until you jumped out and did your own thing. Yeah, yeah. So um, just over, come close to a year and a half later, yeah. lots has changed. You know, the environment, obviously, from banking to buyers agency and then that core focus on property. Mm. But, you know, with that has come a lot of uh, learning along the way as well and seeing uh, the markets in a deeper view than ever before, considering, you know, that banking shift usually relies on a lot of that finance point of view. Yeah. Now we're going finance and into property. And I think from what I understand, the work you've been doing with InvestorKit and have you gone down this pathway of building out this career that you now have as a buyer's agent, sort of you've worked on your philosophy of investing, you've sort of worked up a pillars of investing, which I know help guide and shape the advice that you give to your customers. I think it might be a good opportunity for us to, to have a bit of a chat about that because, you know, all property investors, I feel, need to have a good solid strategy in front of them before they get to start thinking about what type of sorts of property, where they are, whether they're houses or units. And a lot of the strategy is based on what the end goal is. So why are you investing in property and what do you want your life to be at a point in time when you stop investing in property when hopefully you've got a big portfolio that feeds you heaps of money so you can retire and drink pee Klanas or whatever it is, right? So <laughs> so you need, you need some sort of flossy, some sort of doctrine to set yourself on a path of building out a portfolio to make sure you get to your end results. So how have you framed that? Yeah, so I framed it with what I call the three pillars, finance, property, risk and comforts. Mm. These three have to align together. And sometimes it needs a bit of a push in one angle, but sometimes you can see even great properties crumble apart by not having these three come together. To give you an example, like I've, I've seen situations where clients have had strong incomes and borrowing capacities properties that have moved, you know, since back when they purchased it in 2012, 2013, out in the western suburbs of Sydney, right, moving significant values. Mm. And then all of a sudden, the risk and comfort part wasn't a tick for them. And they'd let go of these properties during the downturn or during the correction. And you wonder why? I mean, we've got the great property, you've got borrowing capacity, this was making you money. Uh, But just you can be blinded. When you think it doesn't hit your risk comforts, maybe the tenant wasn't the quality you're after. Maybe there was a couple of repairs that you didn't feel comfortable with. And sometimes those risk and comforts should be stretched and should be pushed. There should be some learning. Sometimes there should be moments where you go, hold on a minute. Even if I had a property with slightly less than the results column or finance that was used in a different way, by holding on to it through a certain period and not having that risk and comfort just eat at me, stop me from having a good night's sleep, that could have been you know, a great success story. So I've seen too many times where, you know, if you don't have that three thing aligned, it just drops off the other. Property is another example. You go in and you go, well, I've got a $2 million borrowing capacity. It might not be for very many, but a $1 million borrowing capacity or, or a 3 million, it all looks very strong. Your risk and comforts are pretty open. And then you're going down the path of a property that you just cash flow is so negative and you can't mm. quite hold it. You're not able to diversify across a few properties and all of a sudden everything's relying on this one thing to hold you afloat. So this is where I find, um, feel that, you know, when you're crafting a strategy, you need to treat these as three independent pillars, but understand that they're holding the building or, you know, to your success and your portfolio head. Yeah. And you talk about comfort. So this is essentially <laughs> the way I'll frame that is that your attitude towards property, property investing, the properties you have and your strategy. So are you comfortable with holding it right now? As life changes, your attitude towards property investment changes a lot. And and all this whole, these three pillars essentially wrapped up in mindset. So, you know, how informed you are to make the best decisions you can at any given time to run the best portfolio that you can. And when we come back from a break, uh, I want to start digging down to this first one, which is a finance, something I know which is close to you, Arjun, and your uh, the role that you had thinking back with uh, your time at Commonwealth Bank, we're dealing with a lot of sort of, I guess, not high net worth individuals as well and seeing how people invest. So we'll be back in a moment. Worried about making the wrong choice with your next investment? You're not alone. If you truly want to become the master of your own lifestyle design through real estate, then you need to speak with Dashdot Buyers Agents, who will help you acquire cash flow positive properties in high growth areas with value and potential, so you can create more freedom in your life. Visit dashdot.com.au forward slash SPI. 
Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with uh, Arjun Paliwell. We're chatting Arjun's pillars of investing and uh, finance being uh, one of the key pillars of, of for any property investor, I think. And you hear a lot of people say this, that property investment is a game of finance. If you can get finance, you're in the game. If you can't get finance, you're out of the game. So fortunately, we're in the lowest interest rate environment than there has been for many, many, many years, if not forever. Unfortunately, it's still bloody hard to get finance. So it's a bit of an oxymoron right now. But things seem to be getting a little easier. There's been some, uh, the Reserve Bank and some of the prudential regulators have sort of tapped banks on the shoulder and lenders on the shoulder saying, hey, look, maybe it's time to relax a little bit and let's make finance a little bit easier. Are you seeing that? Are you actually seeing that play out now, Arjun? Yeah, so I'm seeing yeah. a bit of uh, ease come up in the finance, especially from, you know, just the borrowing calculations uh, with, with consideration to interest rates being now a core component of the borrowing capacity mm. rather than before it was very much relying off that assessment rate at a hard number. I think that flexibility is helping people check out their options a bit more and, and it's opening up markets a little bit. And it's going to get easier over time. Do you do you guys do mortgage broking? You work with mortgage brokers, and what are they saying right now? Yeah, so the mortgage brokers that we're working with, what we're finding is that you know, firstly, it's coming back to a customer's you know own individual uh, profile. Yeah. And whilst we can you know say great borrowing capacity, interest rates, all these things are starting to come together, that habit of spending, where you spend it, how much you spend. You know how simply you can lay it out to a bank. I think when it comes down to that finance pillar of the strategy, even mortgage brokers are saying simplicity, yeah. right? There are loads of fancy new ways these days of how to best save money in your bank account, the, the hundreds of accounts that you should have in order to have money for this and money for that and money for this. But you could be shooting yourself in the foot by trying to make this ultimate, you know, clear strategy because you just aren't able to explain the picture to someone who looks at your banking, has probably a couple hours on the desk before they have to jump to the next file and make a very quick decision. So I think from that finance pillar, what mortgage brokers, including myself, when we're working closely with customers, simplicity is key. That's a big part. So banks, yeah, and I think a lot of people get this wrong, a lot of investors get this wrong, or borrowers in general, they think that banks don't want to lend you money. Banks love lending money, right? Like that's how they make money is by lending money to Australians and and real estate in Australia has long been a pillar of not only our banking sector, but the whole wider economy. So if banks are happy and banks are lending money and banks are making money, everyone's superannuation is doing a lot better, the cycle continues and it goes. So banks want to lend money, but they want to make it as easy as possible to lend that money. So to your point, if someone shows a very complicated financial structure, mm. it gets hard to lend money and they're a lot more hesitant to lend money. And for a lot of people, unless you're really a self-employed, an SME or a self-employed person, you should be able to keep your finances relatively simple. Mm. Um, unnecessarily overcomplicating them just makes life so much harder. It also relates, I guess, Arjun, to the structure in which you invest, right? If you're just yeah. you know, investing in trust is a very different game, isn't it? Yeah, and I think um, – when making that decision on entities and structures, there's obviously your core parties, right? You go, all right, my accountant's going to be a big part of this because of the taxation implications. Then you've got your lawyer who's going to play a big part of it from a protection implication. Mm. But sometimes uh, people have, you know, separated relationships and don't bring these people together. And that can be where it gets a bit messy because accountants can structure a fantastic tax relationship. Someone from the lawyer lawyer's side may be able to put some great protection in place but then if they don't do it with consideration of credit, how are you going to borrow? Like I've seen many people come into situations where they go, well, I set this up so my husband's assets are away from my assets or I'm the wife here and my assets that I own, vice versa. And because we've got the separate trust here, he's actually or she's the director of, of that company. And then we go to the bank point with this fancy, fancy structure and they go, well, you're not the director. We're not lending to you. Mm. Oh, hold on a minute, but I help my partner with everything in that business. I mean, I'm, I'm part of that business. And then they go, well, he'll just make me or she'll just make me an employee. And then, no, you just started becoming an employee. Like yeah. you need some time. So I find structures are very important, but you need to bring all parties to the table. And if you can't put credit as a part of it, it's usually not going to do what you wanted to do in the first place. I think it's a really important point. The best investors I've seen, I'm sure you concur with this, Arjun, is they're able to build a, a team of like a financial advisor, you know, an accountant, a mortgage broker, a buyer's agent, and other advisors and get them all on the same page working for them rather than working in isolation. You know, if you're an SME, if you're a tradie or whatever, you know, which is the backbone of the nation, our tradies, you know, they pretty much, most SMEs are tradies, yeah. so it's great. They're doing pretty well, by the way. <laughs> but um, a lot of tradies or a lot of people, if, if they're getting the wrong advice for their accountant, they'll be going down the path of tax minimization in their business, right, to show no profit so they could, don't have to pay too much tax. Now, 
if you want to borrow money, that's probably not the best strategy. So you've got to show some profit in order to satisfy a bank to want to lend you money. So if your accountant is working on the basis of your business finance, not the fact that you are a property investor, you want to borrow money, you can really shoot yourself in the foot. Yeah. And, and I think uh, that's where when you combine that first part of simplicity and then you have your uh, correct structures and the team around you, those two are a big parts of that property you know, finance fundamental, right? Now, the last thing I think people should consider as part of that finance fundamental, the pillar, is that you know, the interest only and principal and interest, as well as, you know, just where your current loan terms are, where your current repayments are. And now with that, we're in a world of, um, you know, interest rates being lower and, and servicing based off your interest rates. I think this is where people need to start considering not just what they want to borrow for the new place, but what their current debts are servicing at too. Because if all of a sudden you can actually, you know, back in the days you'd save money when you'd refinance your current interest rates, but now you save money and enhance borrowing capacity when you refinance your current interest rate. So I think, you know, looking at that current position, combining that with, um, you know, your simplicity and then combining the right structures, that really puts together a solid fundamental for that finance pillar as part of your strategy. So what's your recommendation, you know, a hypothetical, I'm listening to this podcast going, yeah, that all sounds good, but I'm not really good at the finance bit. I just want to buy property and stuff. What should you be doing to change your mindset around that or, or shift your education or, or your understanding of finance? Because for a lot of people and a lot of the stories I hear from property investors is that there's normally this light bulb moment when they actually get finance and see finance as a utility vehicle for them to achieving wealth creation rather than, you know, something which is a handbreaker in the way of being a property investor. How do you make that mindset shift? Yeah, so often people would say, hey, go chat to your broker or go do this, but I'd look at it some in a different way. Mm. People often start imagining the property portfolio goal and start going, compound calculators, let me throw what I could, buy one a year, and all of a sudden, bam, we're done in 10, right? <laughs> and it gets pretty in insane yeah. when people come up with strategies. Um, I'd say go through a borrowing capacity calculator with a broker or a bank or even on your own. And I think that's when it can get pretty interesting because you don't think of the property, you think of, well, gone are the days where people are putting, I don't even know if there were any days where people are just buying cash deals. Mm. And so I think from that perspective, if you actually map out what I could borrow for how long and add each property to look at the borrowing, not the portfolio and what it's going to become, that could be a really good way to change the mindset. So what you're really saying is that, you know, finance, you want to control finance and not let finance control you. So Spot on. you've got to be on top of it. You've got to own that because- then you can shape your future, I guess, isn't it? Yeah, it's good. We're going to go to another quick break. Um, when we come back, we're going to look at this second pillar of Arjun's, pillars of investing, property. Back in a moment. We get it. You're here listening to the Smart Property Investment Show and you're being interrupted by this ad. We value your ears just as much as your eyeballs, so we'll be quick. Join passionate property investors on Facebook today and we'll fill your Facebook feed with useful tips and tools, plus free education from industry experts and a tribe of people who get it. Passionate property investors. Find us on Facebook now. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Arjun Paliwell and we're just chatting about the pillars of investing. So these are the, the fundamental building blocks you need to get right in order to be a smart property investor and a successful property investor. We just went through finance, all really interesting stuff. And the key message there was that you need to control finance rather than having finance control you. Same probably applies to property, Arjun. Yeah. And I think um, with property itself, controlling property starts with, I guess, eliminating some myths that are out there, right? Quite often we go cash flow versus capital growth, unit versus house, and everything has a massive verse in the middle of it. It's like this belief that started off with where you can't have both. Mm. And I think once we start having those moments where we start to realize, hold on a minute, these capital growth assets became capital growth assets as a result of something called yield suppression. Prices just started rising faster than rents did. So at one stage, almost everything had a higher yield and the value in line with that higher yield. And it was almost cash flow considered properties, right? Yeah. So I think starting off with that position helps you start to go, you know what, I don't have to go the one or the other. I don't have to be put down a bucket of house or unit. And then from there, when you start to look at it, you go, well, if I can put myself in positions of going, here are properties that are yielding well with drivers that are potentially set for capital growth. From that angle, I don't mind if yield suppression comes down. I don't mind if my property suddenly looks like a growth investor property, not a cash flow one. And I think from there, you start going, okay, well, you can have it. How do I now get to the level of whether it's research it by myself? or engage property professionals, whatever it may be. But part two then goes into the whole unit or townhouse and you start going, well, how do I get control of that? I live in Sydney, prices are a certain way for houses, I must go to units. And that's probably one of the most common ones we have in our client base where we go, 
that's not always the case. I mean, we're in Australia here. You live mm. in Sydney. Sydney's a great city. But at the same time, there are markets where you're buying houses, maybe what, three minutes away from beaches, 15 from airports, 20 minutes from the CBD, four to 500K, what you'd be hoping for your two bedroom or one bedroom unit, maybe 40, 50 Ks out from a major Sydney, Melbourne in some cases. So I think once you get the two most common myths that we see, house first unit, because of my affordability and cash flow versus growth, I think that's the core starting point of your property sort of foundation and pillar, because then you start going with everything with an open mind. So when you talk about asset selection, so which property do you buy? Most of that can be done before you even start looking at properties. Like it's just the last 10% really is, is this the right property to meet this particular scenario or, or thesis I've created around cash flow versus capital growth versus location versus whatever? That's the actual what the thing looks like is just a very, very small part of it. Is, mm. that, is that a fair statement? Yeah it, it, yeah, it is a fair statement. And I think even before the property, you know, this starts the, the location, right? And mm. that's where it all comes together. I mean, personally, I believe in a macro, micro on the ground. And I think constantly following this three-step assessment has made me go, well, firstly, Australia is a massive country and, you know, there's so many suburbs and regions out there. And off the back of that, what's that macro trend look like? You know, infrastructure, actual supply, because yeah. supply versus demand is thrown out a lot, Phil, but what's the actual building approvals? What's the population pressure and population growth? Another, another funny one, mm. population growth is not what grows the market. I mean, population pressure grows. Mm. If you've got 300 people moving and 300 houses being built, that's one per person. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> no pressure. But you've got 50 people coming into two places and only two wins, and maybe one of those was built, only one person grew in the population, mm. but the pressure was high. So I think when you get from that macro perspective coming down the micro, you know, the neighborhoods, the actual property itself, how that property fits into, you know, the demographic. Is this a suburb that the makeup is three bidders all around and you're buying that odd four bidder one that's on the on a corner street that maybe isn't having as constant rental sort of comparables in that suburb? Is it the preference? And then once you go beyond that micro, that's when you get on the ground and you, you get the truth out. I mean, how does that property look like without the fancy photos? How does that condition look like before buying? So I think putting those three together, alongside what we discussed about before, I think those things can really start helping that property pillar. And it goes back to also about what the good investors do and, and what the not so good investors do. Uh, the not so good investors, they put the cart before the horse, is what I'm thinking at. So this is about, I've gone and found this great property. It's a red brick thingy-majigamy with this, that, and the other. It's got all these features and benefits. But then they go back and try and prove why that is a good investment rather than going down the path of looking at macro economic fundamentals and how that sort of narrows, that's a big funnel, right? Narrows down to a really pointy point that says, this is the right property, you need to go and find it, then go and find that. So that's what the good investors do. Mm, I totally agree. Mm, it's good. So this concept of risk and comfort, which is uh, your third pillar of investing, Arjun, I get the comfort thing. You know, you've got to, you know, we're speaking a little bit about it on the Smart Property Investment Show around mindset and being solid and strong and not deviating and being resilient and all this stuff, which is, you know, important in all components of life, not just in property investing. But this risk bit of it, it's just the balance between your appetite and attitude towards risk and how that shapes the way you think about these other things we're talking about, as in, you know, building out your portfolio, securing finance, securing property, and really dealing with stuff when probably doesn't go right. Yeah, that's absolutely it. Setting the expectations up front of what can go wrong. And I think if you start with that and, and almost kind of have a negative look on things to begin with, mm. that can actually help you really set where your actual line of risk is. And uh, that's when you look at things like lending levels. Yeah, do you have a 20% deposit, but could you go 10? Mm. Could you go 20? Could you maybe go 10 and some in the offset? Could you maybe go less and pay mortgage insurance and then you know see where that takes you? So I think that's the starting point, like your lending levels. Other things are age of the property. Yeah. You know, when you can look someone in the eye and go, great location, great property in a great neighborhood, comparable to others, but you're going to get repairs in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Even if the piston building's okay, it's likely in, in more comparison than property B 2015 build, right? So I think if you can set that expectation up front and sometimes it requires a respectful challenge to yourself or to the other person, mm. sometimes it just becomes, you know what, no matter what good property you put in front of this person, they just won't be able to get past that. And I think you need to align a good property within that barrier. And if you can make that happen, then you've got a best of both worlds where you're likely to hold it for, for certain cycles or likely to hold it beyond because of your risk and comfort being met. Does your relationship to risk change over time? It does, mm. definitely. Like uh, I could, I didn't imagine myself investing across, you know, multiple states. Yeah. First one was in Sydney and I thought everyone was going to be in Sydney after that. 
and that changed on the second. But um, that's where I think, you know, the fact that we've got so many markets across this country, capital, regional, you know, so many different suburbs, even within a city that may be going through a certain period, there are usually pockets that are being able to get some of the result thereafter. Mm. And if that's the case, could it be that, you know, let me show you or let me have a look at all these markets across the country, know what's out there, still make that decision based on my risk and comfort, which could be that localized market, but know that, all right, for the second, now that I've seen what's out there, I need to go there for the second. The important point which you're making is that you need to embrace change in your attitudes towards risk because as you become more experienced, your view or visibility towards risk changes considerably. So you start doing stuff and you get comfortable with it to your point around risk and comfort. It's very much a symbiotic relationship, right? The more comfortable we are, the more the greater bandwidth you would have to maybe step outside your traditional um, barriers towards approaching property investments. So the best investors I know are still able to have a real measure and a positive relationship with risk without being too risky. You only really know if you've been too risky when you sort of <laughs> fall down and get a couple of bruises, right? But yeah. uh, you know, until you do that, you're not going to be able to learn from, you know, investing in property and therefore have a greater attitude to risk. So it's okay to make mistakes, but mm, don't, don't make them too big, right? Yeah, definitely. I so think what, are the, what are the mistakes that you don't want to make? Okay, so the mistakes you don't want to make is, you know, get to a level of cash flow that you can look up front and don't feel comfortable with. Yeah. I think that's a starting point. Throw out the yields, throw out the lending leverages, the interest rates, throw in a couple of weeks of vacancy, a couple of repairs. Do you like that? Mm. You can't handle it? Don't do it. So work out what change. the worst case scenario can look like for you. And if in, and if you're okay with that and you think you'd be able to handle it, that's all right. Exactly. And not even from a cash flow perspective. Mm. Consider it from a value drop. Tomorrow drops 10%. How do you feel? Mm. And then tomorrow you have two repairs come up in this area that you can see that is not in a bad condition now. Could last a couple of years, but it looks like there could be something coming up in those years ahead. How do you feel about that? Those are the three things, repair, value, cash flow. Okay. So just go in all eyes open knowing that there's a good chance it may happen. Hopefully it doesn't if you've got your, if your risk appetite isn't too broad. But if it does happen, what are you going to do about it? And when the proverbial hits the fan, that you know what you're going to do about it. You've got a war chest, you've got some capacity to manage through it. It's really good. It's um, I like the way you frame that. I think it's pretty simple, you know, and I think any property investor could understand those three pillars of investing. No, thanks, and, mate. Um, if you haven't got one of them, there's plenty of education. I hope you listen to the Smart Property Investment Show because we chat about this stuff all the time. But while I've got Arjun here in the studio and I've got a couple of minutes with him, I'm going to pick his brain on some spots he's investing in right now, all the secret spots that you're investing in right now. Are you going to give us anything whatsoever? What do you like out there at the moment? What sort of stuff? Yeah, look, there's many, but I'll give you a couple. Okay. Um, like, so- it's just going to be vague. You're actually going to give pinpoint it down to some good places? You know what? Why not? I'll all give right, you a couple of okay. clusters. Good. There we go. All right. So we've got um, the inner north of the Brisbane market and the eastern part of the Brisbane market. So we've okay. got, you know, places between your Manly out to your Wynnum, Manly West. Then you've got your north from, you know, the, the Tagum and the Deegans yep. and, and coming down to the Zilmeres. What I'm liking a lot about those is um, a few of them are, you know, there's many data points we could go through, but just some high level, very simple to understand, mm. spillover effects. Okay. So if you imagine some of your far north suburbs, you've got, you know, Shorncliffe and Sandgate up in the northern Brisbane, you know, Water facing. You open your curtains, you're seeing water, beach, mm. and everything. Now, next door suburbs around these areas are, are priced at 100 to 200K below. And you're literally a couple minutes of walk away, right? And then the spillover effect is, is really where people start to notice that they're near some pretty good patches and they don't mind paying a little bit more for the next door because they see the value in it. Mm. So that's a very high level. Beneath that sits the many data points of where the housing commission levels and the income levels and the and all the signals that we're liking to see. But we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, sales volumes start to pick up in some of these areas. Days on markets are starting to steady out and come down. But a few of these pockets in the north and east of Brisbane, we're seeing some rental pressures build up. You know, usually you, you, the price rental of the Rental pressure. Key. Let's talk yeah. about that really quickly because yeah, yeah. you spoke about population pressure, but it's a probably similar concept, right? Yeah, similar concept. So yeah. usually you find the price going up or price going down drives the yield. Mm. You know, it goes up faster than rents. Cool. Yields come down. Goes down faster than rents rise. I mean, so the, the yields come down, right? Our yields go up. Now, in this factor, we've got prices steadily, nothing major shift, mm. but we've got yields coming up. And that's a sign of where people are starting to put competition and, and put pressure on these rents, where even without price being the main indicator, people want to start 
you know, renting out here. Adelaide, that's another interesting one. Okay, Radelaide. Rad- good old Radelaide, yeah. co- where the coffee's good. I'll tell you that. Coffee's you really good over there, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, t- I, t- I wouldn't think of Adelaide with good coffee. I think about maybe some good plonk. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. You're surprising, right? Yeah. But um, the southern, the, the Marion region of Adelaide and even your city of Charles Stewart and, yeah. and Port, you know, Port Adelaide regions, they're probably being talked about for a little bit, but... One thing that we like to look out for is your negotiation movements. Okay. We like to get into a market and once we start seeing some negotiation trends change, that's a signal for us. What do you mean by negotiation trend? So imagine uh, we've started buying so parts of the, the western parts of Adelaide and the you know southern, you know, maybe what, under 10 from beaches, under 15 from airport, under mm. 20 from CBD. 20K, 30K, 40K, we're able to get these numbers off some prices on yeah. this thing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden- next door properties or down the road properties starting to get a bit more realistic with pricing or the pressures are building up and maybe that number changes to five and 10K. Okay. I'd like to think with time, my negotiation is getting better and, I, and I'm pretty confident it is. But when you start to see the markets that you were just in a couple of months ago and the six months before that, that's a healthy sign for us and the buying windows are changing. Yeah. And I think that's a good point for, and what your buyer's agent should be doing is that they should be buying at that point in time when those gaps are bigger. And then when they see those gaps becoming smaller is the time when most good buyer's agents normally go and find that next place, right? So, yeah. you know, um, it's a really good point now whole pressure on negotiation and when when askings go above you know when people are paying what the askings go about you're in a very very different market so um yeah and when you buy from one agent multiple times mm. you get to understand tendencies and if those tendency people's tendencies don't change they stay pretty similar and it's just the outcome of what's changing so if the outcome's changing the same person we know how to negotiate with this person what they like what they don't like and all of a sudden things are tightening mm. that's not the person that's the market what are you seeing down Adelaide that's supportive of the, the changing market down there? And people have been chatting about Adelaide for 10, 15 years about how it's a good place. And it's a steady market, right? It, you don't have your sort of big peaks and troughs that you see in some other markets. It's it's by and large a, a relatively steady market. Is there anything in particular going on down there that might give it a bit more of a kick in the backside? Yeah, so four indicators we love to see for sale price movements, mm. gross yield, Sales volumes, days on market. Okay. And then we wrap it up nicely with, you know, what's happening from vacancy rates, supply and demand, and applications and so forth. Okay. So when we start to see, okay, well, you know, agents are listing for more. That's your for sale price ticking up. Sales volumes are occurring more. Buyers and sellers coming together. Days on market's coming down. They want to sell it a bit quicker. Gross yield moving up even as prices move up. That's rent pressures. Okay. So we're seeing a lot of that occur. But at the same time, uh, because of that, I guess, lack of excitement in Adelaide, people forget how well it's done. Over the last 30 years, Adelaide houses have outgrown Sydney. Yeah. So Sydney rising uh, as per ABS and CoreLogic at 5% per annum, Adelaide 5.3% per annum. Yeah. Right, so I think that's a bit of a, a shake up once you clean that and go. Hold on a minute. Let's let's ignore the the big ups and downs that we see, and let's see the steadiness. And then now you see markets where you can't see a patch of green in terms of the land. It's mm. all it's all well built. You see, I'm sure population growth may not be as high, but if supply is not moving at the same speed or or faster, then it's all relative. And then you start seeing these signals come together, and that's when affordability and all that starts to look more appealing. And government spending a few bucks in there as well, and. By memory, they got a new premier in there maybe 18 months ago. He's, He's good with the, the social. Yeah. He's good with the social media, so that's good news. Yeah. I mean, people are seeing it. I think that's a big start. Stephen Marshall, I believe, yeah, is the name. I definitely recommend people follow him on LinkedIn just to get an idea of, of Adelaide and what's mm. happening. He's probably been one of the most active ones on, on social, and I think that's helping people see a lot of, hey, you know, the space agency stuff, the submarines, Corflands yeah. uh, from Germany coming for their first mm. – uh, you know, outside of the is Europe that where store? it's starting? Is it starting Adelaide? Adelaide is yeah, it? good old Adelaide's getting Coughlin's. So this is um, a competitive Audi, really, isn't it? And yeah. it's supposed to be bigger and better. And I'm not going to diss Audi. I like Audi. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, but good competition. And I guess Adelaide's a good market to test it, right? It's, um, mm. it's not huge, but it's big enough and it's representative, I think, of a cross-section of Australia. So see how it goes down there. But from what I hear, the Premier is doing a pretty good job down there and and there's a lot of investment going in, all that stuff you mentioned around- Business confidence um, yeah, is up business as well. confidence is good. Job growth is increasing. A lot yep. of it driven by by sort of expanding the economy in that defence space around, and also the space agency, if people don't know, um, based down in South Australia. So and, and commercial the, the property stamp duty agency. waivers. Yeah. A bit yeah. of everything. It's all happening. Yeah. Place to be. <laughs> I like Adelaide. I never really get down there that very often, but- uh, 
I'll have to, you travel down there a bit? Yeah, quite yeah. a bit. So um, maybe every quarter, every six months, yeah. I've been, been going, heading down to Adelaide myself. What do you do when you get there? You just sort of jump in a car and start? Well, I did say the coffee was good, right? So yeah. it started off with that. Yeah. You just start um, lurking around, see what's going on, do you? <laughs> well, look, Secrets I mean, on the, the ground. Secrets of the buyer's agent. Yeah, no one knows he's there. You know? <laughs> I reckon the mayor, the key to the city will be giving to you saying, Arjun, this is a great place to buy. You know, come here. But, uh, hey, thanks for coming in. Thank always you, enjoy our, our chats and- uh, We'll have to bring you back in again in our six months' time and check in and see what you're up to. What do you Sounds think we'll be good. chatting about? I reckon we'll be uh, chatting about, you know, how much legs were in some of the corrections yep. and uh, hoping to give you a bit of an update on my portfolio, see where Very that's been good. going. So that'd be good. Yeah. Have you done anything with it? Don't, don't, yeah, don't yeah. wreck anything. But you, you, you do, <laughs> So you're still doing stuff? Yeah, still doing stuff. So, um, you know, we, we jumped on the 10th one recently and, okay. and, and now we're actually moving to get finance sort of jiggling around for the next project. Mm. And yeah, looking around some of these spots I've mentioned here, okay. as, as well as even a few regional Victoria markets that mm. are appealing. So yeah. yeah. Well, let's, let's, let's find out. Let's schedule that in. We'll cool. sort that out. Thanks, Arjun. I do appreciate you coming in and sharing uh, not only your own journey in property, but some of the, the great work you're doing for your clients. So it's good to have you back. Thank you, man. Remember to check out smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. And if you didn't see it, Arjun did a great webcast recently on smartpropertyinvestment.com.au. You don't have to buy expensive to buy good. Go and check it out. He was with Terry Ryder. Really interesting stuff. I watched it and I was riveted to the full on the side of my seat trying to work out what was going to happen. So some really good stuff in there. Go and check it out. If you just click on the the live stream button within uh, smartpointinvestment.com, you can go and watch it. And uh, I'm sure you can connect him with Arjun after that as well. And I actually pinpointed Arjun down. I asked him whether or not he'd done a review yet for the Smart Property Investment Show when he comes to the studio, and he said no. So he's thankfully done one for me. So thank you, Arjun. But uh, the message to you is there's one way you can really help us out here and everyone's always going phil how can i sort of help you out on smart property this is one way please keep those review coming on uh, wherever you listen to these podcasts itunes is probably one of the most popular let us know what you think we're doing and how we're going about it and uh please leave those reviews there the five stars are the ones we like the most but um if you want to give us four stars, that's okay, but you can contact me at uh, editor at smartproblemainvestment.com.au and you let me know how we can improve. So uh, always trying to do that with this particular podcast. And if you'd like to come on the show, we'd really invite you to do so. Whether you've got one property or 100 properties, you can contact that same email, editor at smartproblemainvestment.com.au. We'll be back again next time. Until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. If you're a regular listener to the Smart Property Investment Show, then odds are you're already a property fanatic who loves hearing stories on investing from real people. The good, the bad and the ugly. Be with people just like you and join the group Passionate Property Investors on Facebook now. Become part of a community who know what to do and when to do it. And the time to do it is now. Passionate Property Investors. Tribe, tools and tips. Find us on Facebook today.